Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, striking up the live stream and not just striking up the live stream. This is the first time we've done it on our Miami channel. So this is the first live stream dedicated strictly for Miami and uh, our close to 600 subscribers here on our Miami channel. And uh, we figured the best way to um, uh, kind of launch the live stream Miami style is bring on uh, the wholesome one. We've got Dwayne Wonderful. Holloway on the line. He is the wholesome one. Dwayne, how you doing today? I'm doing wonderful, man. Passed a nice exam this morning on pace to graduate in May. So it's all looking great. Yes, it's always uh, good to see the light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> Most definitely. Now I just need my Canes offense to see the same. <laughs> okay, well, we'll dive into that. And uh, we will explain to everyone that uh, um, the wholesome one joins us uh, via uh the, the the YouTube live stream here, but we weren't able to get the video functioning, but you, we can hear you loud and clear. So that's, that's what's important. All right. I'm here. I'm here. So we've got Duke coming up on uh Saturday night. It's a home game five and three need some help now to win the coastal division with actually the biggest game of the year. Now is suddenly Virginia and Pitt. Who would have thought that one Virginia <laughs> and Pitt playing for first place tonight on a Friday night. So we got uh, Duke, Miami. So my goodness, you, you said it before we started the live stream, uh, the, the, the fixing of the offense. How, yeah, how do you, yeah. how do you take that one on? I'm personally, um, this one will be a surprise, but for the first time I can honestly say in my life, I'm not too confident going into a Duke football game, not Duke basketball, Duke football. And it's more along the lines of what's going on with Coach Mark Rick as opposed to what we're doing as a team. Um, at this point, defensively, we're about 60 to 70 plays less than we had played at this point last year. And uh, anybody that watched us last year knows that our defense was on the field way too much. You know, a lot of the last three games of that season to where the guys were just too tired and when we tried to, to try to bring in other people, you know, to get the depth going, they just weren't up to par. And that's what resulted in a lot of losses towards the end. And that same guy who contributed to that 0-3 finish is now our starting quarterback. Um, unbeknownst to anyone with common sense, he continues to be our quarterback. Um, I listen to Mark Rodgers. I watch your show. No matter what it is, I watch every video. So, I've heard everybody get on here and clown him and and say, you know, he's the worst. I usually try to be the nice guy, the happy medium, but even I've seen the light. This guy's just not the quarterback. And um, whatever Nikosi Perry has done to get into the doghouse, he needs to find a, a trap door and get out of it. <laughs> and I'm not one to wish injury on anyone. I would prefer you earn your job the right way, doing things the right way as a leader. The quarterback is usually the leader of the team. And uh, this team seems to play a lot better when the Kosey Perry is on the field. The wide receivers are excited to run their routes because they honestly feel like this guy can get the ball to them. Even speedy Jeff Thomas, you know, even something simple as a slant route, which was jumped multiple times by Boston College. Some resulting in interceptions, some not. Some, you know, the simple out routes that were jumped against Virginia that gave their free safety ACC defensive player of the of the week because Malik Rozier just loved to throw to the other team. So the, the offensive woes, even though we're at home, it's a little harder to beat us at home now uh, with the defense and the crowd that comes. But in Miami, you win and they come. And at this point, I don't even think we'll have a big, you know, a nice crowd Saturday. I think a lot of people are very, very out on Mark Rick as the offensive coordinator and calling plays at this time. So I think that they'll voice their opinion when Malik goes on the field. They'll probably boo him as he's going on the field, which is fine. You know, that's your right. And uh, if we start off slow, which we have as a whole team, actually, because even you alluded to the defense, the first three drives against Boston College and against Virginia were not good. We start slow as a team. So um, 
you, you know, it, it's going to be a tough game to sit there and watch. Thank God I'll be at work. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to have to catch up with it afterwards. Uh, you, you know, you got to put up with the pain, wholesome one, because this is your job. This is what you've chosen to do in, ter in terms of being a fan. But now you're a media contributor, so you got to do your, your work. Oh, and I know you do. I'll definitely uh, be standing at the, because I bounce at a club up here, so I'll be standing at the door with my phone in my hand, going bananas, just like, what's going on? <laughs> just losing it at the door, and it's it's kind of funny, but, uh, you know, Mark Rick's play calling isn't funny. It makes it kind of sad to watch sometimes. All right, I'm going to start with a point that I made uh, to the video and the live stream that you alluded to with uh, Cam Underwood from State of the U., and that's that I just don't understand for any right thinking coach, not even near the caliber of Mark Richt or what he's supposed to be going back to when the team stepped off the field at the Orange Bowl. You just finished off a season. We know we don't have to go through the good and the bad. But the performance of Malik Rocher at the conclusion of the season, we know what it was. OK, we get into the offseason season. And I could have taken the line in August at some point that Malik won the job because of X, Y, and Z through the spring, through the summer, individual drills, through August camp, through all the scrimmages that nobody gets to see, all that. But he won the job like immediately. Right. Again. And we know Nikosi Perry had some off-field issues and there's speculation as to what that was. It obviously wasn't that serious. Mm -hmm. He suspended for one game. It uh, never, never exited him from the program or from participation in the program. And yes, he may make a couple mistakes. Uh, to to be fair, he had an awful first half against Virginia. But as you mentioned, there's there's no question when you watch the two guys throw the football and the capability that they have to deliver it where it needs to be thrown. Nikosi Perry's not going to do it all the time, but he has the ability to do it at any time. Malik Rocher is just, he's just limited. He's a senior. He wasn't going to get any better or much better between his junior and senior years. And he's probably regressed. Uh, maybe it's a lack of confidence at this point as well. Mm -hmm. And then on top of all that, even if you were playing, if you were, could suddenly play for the national championship and they said, regardless of what your record is, we're going to put you in the national championship game. You got to go with your best quarterback. I, I still don't think that's Rocher. I still think that's Nikosi Perry, but this is this, these decisions need to be made with a future in mind. And they don't seem to be ma made with the future in mind where you've got an outgoing senior and with all due respect, who cares if his feelings are hurt versus mold and develop and groom and not just from a football standpoint, but in terms of a mindset and knowing that he has our full trust and that he's confidence that he has confidence in our program and that he trusts me as a head coach. I need to groom Nikosi Perry for next year. It's, it's I 100% I agree with you. Um, I personally don't even think that it could even be up for debate at this point. But something something is going on that everybody else doesn't know. And that's the only thing that we can honestly, you know, put on our shoulders and say, hey, this must be the reason why something's going on mysteriously in the background. But regardless of all of that, if the kid is so much better, I mean, so much better than what you have out there on the field, why, even if it's for some disciplinary reason which i think he's he's lived that he's felt that long enough from the social media slander from the people calling into the the, the radio or whatever going off on mark rick and his play calling and mark rick willing to well i wouldn't even say willing stubbornly saying this is how it's gonna go because i said that's i said so that's the main reason why Nicosi isn't the starter anymore. It's because Mark Rick wants to see Rogier out there, either for disciplinary reasons or just to be able to say, I can win with Malik Rogier. Either way, 
he's really throwing away just like Cam Underwood alluded to yesterday, a championship caliber defense. In total defense, we are up there in the conversations with the likes of Michigan and Alabama and Clemson. Maybe if you watch the game, it's not the same dominance as an Alabama or a Michigan or a Clemson, but as far as yards, statistics, TFLs, interceptions, we are ranked amongst those guys. And in 2018, that's a great thing to be able to say because just two, three years ago, Mark, in 2015, 2014, it was the vice versa. You know, we were top 15 offensively, but defensively, the only defensive player that you could talk about was Denzel Perriman. Now it's we got 11 guys on defense who are draftable players, maybe even top four round draftable players. But offensively, we have all this talent, and we're ranked 86th in total offense. <laughs> I mean, it's it's crazy to to wrap your head around that thing. And I and I'll let you I'll let you go after this. Alonzo said something. Alonzo one two one nine. Go check him out. Uh, subscribe to him. You know, my big brother. He said, think about how. Let's take Washington State, for example. Offensive juggernaut, I guess you would say. They put up plenty of yards and plenty of touchdowns. You know, that's what they do in the Pac-12. But could you be able to name me one offensive lineman that's drafted out of there? No. Could you be able to tell me a running back or a wide receiver? Uh, Never running backs, wide receiver. Drafted, no. But they put up all these points and all of these yards. They break all these records. So there's no excuse for when people say the offensive line or they say, you know, wide receiver play isn't up to par. They're not running the, the right route, which is wrong because they are. Just like you talked about last night when Jeff Thomas had the bomb perfectly. And if anything, just throw it out the back of the end zone. Put all you have into that. But Malik Rozier's arm is good for 35 yards on a great day, unless it's a seam route where he can put everything he has into it and step into the throw. But I say all of that to say there's no excuse for the offensive woes. And the only person that isn't publicly accepting what's going on and saying I'm going to make a change is Mark Rick. And I don't honestly see anything in the foreseeable future that will change any of that unless something comes down from the higher ups, which they won't do mid season. They'll do something in the off season, but I don't, I don't see much changing right now uh, offensively, especially at the quarterback position. So Washington state uh, only has one loss right now. That's uh, to USC. They've beaten uh, Oregon. They beat Stanford. They're vying for a Pac-12 championship. I'm looking at their NFL draft selections. They've not had anyone at those positions in the last four years. So nobody from an offensive skill standpoint, aside from Luke Falk, their quarterback, who, of course, you're familiar with playing against uh, in the Sun Bowl a few years ago. But at running back, wide receiver, offensive line, nobody. They had a fifth-round offensive lineman last year, a guard. Uh, so, again, basically... Uh, null and void there in comparison to Miami skill position players in the NFL draft. Right. We're joined by the wholesome one here at Mark Rogers TV, Miami. It's our first live stream, just focusing on Miami football right here um, on our Miami channel. So we're glad to be joined by the wholesome one. And even though you can't see them, we know you can hear them crystal clear. We've got a few questions coming in. One has to deal with the offense, plain and simple that Carl is saying that just eliminate Rozier. And next year, and I still have an issue with uh, mixing up Rozier and Rocher, but I keep hearing that he's supposed to be pronounced Rocher. But, uh, of course, we've been saying Rozier ever since we knew about the kid. Uh, <laughs> that, um, that basically the offense has to be better next year because he's not going to be there. And whether it's Nikosi Perry or Jaron Williams, you're going to have a, a larger upside at quarterback next year. Oh, yeah, of course. Of course. And let's not forget about Cade Weldon. Let's not forget about, you know, we might be bringing in a quarterback this class. We may or may not. But at the end of the day, 
if I had to give an overall to Malik Rozier, to my video game guys and gals out there who are listening, NCAA, you had overalls, Mark. I don't know if you've ever played NCAA football. Can't right? say that I have. Okay, well, on this game, it it's a it's a scale of uh, zero to ninety nine. Obviously, you've you've been in grade school. You know that ninety nine, well, ninety to ninety nine, a hundred is an A, and you know eighty to eighty nine is a B, so on and so on. So, on this video game simulation system that we all played growing up, um, one thing about Miami is they would always have a B plus or higher because it would go off of the rankings from the previous season plus the recruiting rankings. So they would always have all of this talent, you know, on the team. But if you had to give one to Malik Rozier, it would be a 69, a D plus. And on his best day, if you, even if he went through the whole season, he could be probably a 74. So a C guy. He's just a C guy. He's just a guy. And regardless of the fact that he beat that school in Tallahassee, regardless of the fact that he was one of the only quarterbacks to lead us to a 10-win 10, 10 season in over a decade, that makes you really sit and think how good to great we must have been last year on defense to where a guy like this who led us to 10 – well, he didn't really lead us to 10 wins, but he's our quarterback, so you have to say that, figuratively speaking – led us to 10 wins, had plenty of ups and downs, a lot of woes and a couple of peaks, but a lot of woes. And we were still able to win, you know, a couple of big games. And to me, Mark, we're going to keep calling him Rozier until he changes. If you're great, then we change your name. Uh, you know, you get to the ACC championship and upset Clemson, then we'll have a conversation. Until then, it's Rozier. So the time's running out for him to to make a name change then because he's only got a few more games if he keeps his starting job. Uh, he doesn't seem to be earning that starting job, but uh, be given that starting job. He's only got a few more games uh, for in the regular season to be able to earn that what he wants to be called Rocher. <laughs> so we'll we'll go with uh, we'll go with the wholesome ones criteria there. Uh, I was just thinking as you were running through. Um, the accomplishments of last year's team, how good the defense played, that they were on pins and needles and things were going their way against the likes of North Carolina and some other teams that shouldn't have challenged them, Virginia and Syracuse. And then they they were able to pull out those games and then the the dam broke in, in the last three games. Um, how many times when we, uh, we, we often say on here, whether we're talking to you or another Miami contributor, that there's about two or three games a year when the other team has equal, arguably better, but at least equal talent. And the other games, Miami has significantly um, separated itself as having the talent advantage. But when you look at quarterback, I'm just thinking through the ACC last year before a lot of these quarterbacks moved on, that generally they had the disadvantage at quarterback against these teams going through, of course, Kelly Bryant, better Kenny Pickett, the pit quarterback who was making his first start. He played much better and uh, he was coming off a Virginia tech game in which he let a comeback and almost a win there. Um, man, it looks like uh, Ian book should have been in the game for Notre Dame. Not that it would have much mattered because uh, that was obviously the high point of the season. Uh, Josh Jackson, a much better quarterback at Virginia tech um, between Brendan Harris and Zach Surratt. Uh, I'm not going to say North Carolina did, but uh, so there would be the one exception. Eric Dungy, of course, a quarterback for Syracuse, better. DeAndre Francois, Florida State, better. We'll take Georgia Tech out of the mix because of the style offense. Uh, yeah, I'm looking at uh, better quarterbacks all the way across the board, except for North Carolina and Virginia had a quarterback in um, Kurt Bent, Kurt, who was drafted and who's on an NFL roster right now. So he's better. So you played one team last year, I would say, that had a worse quarterback situation. Otherwise, that's something you had to overcome in winning 10 consecutive games. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And and a lot of those games are really tough to watch because you got the Georgia Tech who, 
I don't know what their final ranking was, but they were nowhere near us as far as, you know, top 10. I don't even know if they finished top 25. They went five and six. Wow. Look at that. And we only beat them, you know, last second by one point. You got UNC. And to me, that was the glimpse. Maybe that was the glimpse into the future that nobody paid attention to because we won. But Malik Rozier completed like 12 passes that entire game, you know, against a throttled UNC roster. And we were number three, number two, number three at that time going into that game. And they had won one or two games that whole year. And we barely snuck out of there with it. And most of the time, Mark, you get a W, everybody forgets what's really going on in the game. As long as it, the win column has another W in it, everybody kind of just packs their thing, smiles, and goes home. But people like me and you and, and, and Cam and, and Alonzo, you know, you turn on the film and you say, maybe this team isn't as good as their win-loss column says. Last year towards the end, you go back maybe even the last, right after Notre Dame, we had Virginia come in. And, you know, Ben Kirk, like you just said, is an NFL guy. He may not be an NFL starter, but he made an NFL roster. He tore that defense to shreds, and we had to figure something out. We were quickly down 21-7 to about four minutes into that game. And we saw Malik go 34-48 for 405 and four touchdowns. He just went crazy. And that's when everybody said, okay, maybe that was the game to get everything to click and we can go from there. Um, but that was his best game. That game in the Duke of 2015, uh, when we had the blessing from the referees, as I call it, with the eight lateral win, you know, a team like Miami should never have to do something like that against the caliber of Duke and be happy about it. But hey, W's are W's. Um, but th there's a lot of things that Malik Rozier has done good for this program. A lot of W's that he won, but his time here is done. And it's sad that a, a college student like me or a regular fan or maybe some little kid watching a game can honestly sit there and say, hey, this guy sucks. <laughs> maybe he shouldn't be in the game. And all due respect to him and his family, he's a scholarship, Division One scholarship quarterback. You have to respect the fact that he can do that. Me as a former NAIA football player, I was in Division One, So I respect the fact that he's a D1 quarterback. And I respect him as a man, as a human. But he is not the quarterback for the University of Miami today or the future. And to see Mark Rick pull Nikosi Perry out of that game, how, if I'm Nikosi Perry, do I trust you moving forward, Coach? Am I going to have to look over my shoulder at every – mess up that you're going to just yank me out of the game. You know, I will wonder how his family feels watching that game. They might, they probably know what really went down because I haven't seen them doing uproar on social media, which usually happens nowadays, or, you know, call into a radio station and say, he's not treating my son, right? Parents today are a little different, but I haven't seen any of that. I haven't heard any of that. So maybe they actually know what's really going on behind the scenes but i know as someone who was recruited if you tell me you have my back you give me an opportunity to go out on this field and prove you either right or wrong we just beat a rival team who to everyone in miami who's a miami hurricanes fan that was probably our super bowl for the season i mean it was our natty honestly to beat them and you can see why now that we have a downslide we were one and five in the last six six years after that game. But to see this guy have a great comeback against a team who gave their all in that game. Florida State put everything they had into that game. And you see why they haven't won a game since. Well, no, they did win one game, but it was against an inferior opponent in Wake Forest. But they put all that they had in that game. This young freshman, redshirt freshman quarterback has a comeback make some amazing throws and then you yank him the very next week because he started out slow. 
I don't see how he can trust Mark Rick moving forward. I don't trust him. I tell you that much. Yeah, and that's the guy that you want to have trust you, that you want to have buy-in. It's not the outgoing senior. Sure, that's a nice story. That's a nice thing. You would want to continue that relationship. But Malik Rozier, in terms of his ability to help this program, even if he is good, let's say he was injured the first eight games of the season and you started five and three and the season was lost. Let's say somebody was running away with the division like Clemson. If Clemson was in the division and they're gone, you know, you've already lost three games, two in the conference. They're they're done. They've won it. They've wrapped it up. And let's say Malik Rozier came out of the sky. And let's say he was hurt and he comes back and he's a really good quarterback. Let's say he's somebody else. Well, uh, you, you could you could make the option uh, and have the opportunity at that point to decide, OK, well, I've already weathered eight games with Nikosi Perry and he's the future and I've invested eight games in him. With all due respect, and we appreciate what you've done for the program, Malik, but uh, we can play out our last four games, get to a bowl game, and we need to develop him for the future. And that would be a very reasonable decision to make. Definitely, that's the best decision to make. But I could understand the loyalty to Malik. You've been hurt the first eight games. You would have been the starter. We could be on our way to a championship, but that's not the case. And you're coming back, and we're going to honor you as the starter who didn't lose his job because of we're not going to allow it because of injury, and you can start the rest of the season. We're going to finish really strong and probably better for you this season with you in the lineup than we would with Nikosi. But that's that's not the case. Once Rick made the decision that you just – detailed he put himself in a bad spot because if Malik comes in against Virginia and saves the day then okay that's that's why you bring in the backup quarterback um but he already went Malik benched him Perry and now he's benching Perry in the middle of a game and bringing back in Malik and it fails and so he has two two failings on both sides and now what does he do well <laughs> it's what he did and, and i just think that's the you're making no investment in the future your investments with the talent that you have that's going to be here for a couple more years and now he can't trust you just like you outlined of course and then let's be honest could you imagine and i know you can't transfer in conference majority of the time but imagine malik rosier transferring to a louisville or better yet, I know he probably wouldn't do this. Imagine him going to a Willie Target offense or you know, transferring somewhere where they will allow him to to freely throw the ball and run as he as he should please. Then we'll be mad as Hurricane fans. Oh, we had him. Oh, we he could have been doing that here. But now you got Mark Rick still calling plays like he has – like this is Tallahassee of 1996. You know, he was he was calling plays when I was born. I was born June 29th of 1996. That's back when Mark Rick was calling plays and it was successful. Okay. It's November 2nd, 2018. And he's still calling the same 24 lead with no fullback and H back tight end. He's still calling the same slant seam out route combination. Like it's Florida State in 1998. I, I I just I don't understand how this is still a relevant thing. I don't I don't know. Maybe I'll understand once I get into coaching in a couple of months, um, on a college level. Maybe I'll understand what it's like to be stuck in my ways and think I know everything and no one can talk to me. Maybe I'll get it. But right now today, I know I can learn anything from a four year old kid all the way up to a. 60 year old 70 year old elder you can be taught things to help you in life and right now mark rick is just like hey i'm mark rick and that's the bottom line because mark rick said so this is mark rogers tv the voice of college football this is uh our miami channel so we enjoy the miami coverage and uh talking miami football with the wholesome one on a regular basis also cam underwood state of the u alonzo one two one nine and uh, strike up the chat room, of course, for you to voice your comments and questions. 
Also, we want to remind you that if you love college football top to bottom across the nation, you join me at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. So you just deviate from where you are right now and you just go over to Mark Rogers TV, just search it in YouTube, or you just make it easy on yourself and just type in MarkRogersTV.com, MarkRogersTV.com, and you'll see that we cover the landscape of college football. All right, talking more Miami here. Uh, Duke is coming up on Saturday night. So if you can call the shots, wholesome one, if uh-huh. you heard from Miami fans, I don't hear any Miami fans defending Mark Richt. Um, so I've yet to hear that, which is fine. I, I'm not defending him either because I think he's botched this situation. I defended him coming into this season uh, in place of not winning a national championship. I've heard that knock on him for years, obviously. And I think there's a little bit of luck that plays into that. But this this entire season, he's botched. So if you're running the show, if you're the athletic director with all the power the administration gives you, would you simply fire Mark Richt? Or would you give him a stern talking to and tell him that he needs to revamp the offense, give those chores to somebody else, and bring in a top flight offensive coordinator? Uh, wow. Athletic director Dwayne Holloway, University of Miami. That sounds amazing. <laughs> All right. Um, Mark Rick. We do that for you, and we make me the commissioner of college football. Oh, man. Now that sounds good. Hopefully, we get a couple of. Uh, invites to the tournament man (laughs) we have to be a good team to do so um but honestly first of all the fire mark rick thing that's just a complete overreaction um and even on my channel i've i've been very calm i haven't made a video since i did my hate week preview for florida state um because i'm a very emotional person i get very passionate and I would not want to put on YouTube, especially me trying to interview for a graduate assistant positions <laughs> on YouTube, me going off and cursing and flipping tables about Mark Rick and his offense. Um, but big picture moving forward in the program, if I'm thinking a 10 year, 10, 10 year, you know, uh, stint, if I'm thinking all the way to 2028, Mark Rick is a head man. It's a great move. As a CEO, he can oversee things. Um, you won't have to worry about NCAA sanctions. You won't have to worry about at least that we know of, because you know SEC money can cover a lot of things. But he, you know, he has things as far as getting guys uh, right with religion, and uh, parents tend to love him. Mothers, and you know, have one of the highest graduation rates in the SEC when he was in Georgia. So. You're going to come here, get your degree, get right with the Lord and things of that nature. And on the other hand, you'll play some real good football. But just like you alluded to before, he's a B-plus guy. I remember you doing your coaching rankings this past summer in the offseason when we were all coming up with videos to try to get us to, you know, week one, Miami and uh, and LSU. Everybody was just trying to do something to get us to that. And um, – you said that Mark Rick is a good coach. He may never be a great coach, but he's a good guy. He's a BB plus coach. As a overseer, as you know, like a chief of police or governor, overseeing things, not necessarily being hands on with everything, but overseeing things, he's a good coach. So I would keep him as a head coach, as a CEO thing he did the last couple of years, the last eight seasons at Georgia, which they were pretty successful. Um, but I'm putting my, I'm putting a hand out to, uh, Art Browse's son, who's currently at FAU. Um, there's also the offensive coordinator It's escaping my mind right now, but he kind of went, uh, excuse me, excuse me. In the Kane family, he started following a lot of the coaches on Twitter. He's the offensive coordinator at, at, uh, Memphis. But, you know, Memphis already has their head coach calls the plays. So he's kind of like that same thing as Thomas Brown. He's the OC by title, but not the the play caller. Um, But bringing a spread-type team to the University of Miami to be able to match up with Manny Diaz's defense, if we can hold on to Manny Diaz, because some schools are going to call him for the head coaching position. But – 
if we can hold on to him and bring in a, a marquee offensive coordinator or a young up and coming guy, because I think in a city like Miami, they have to be able to relate to these kids and have a connection to the kids. Something that Mark Rick couldn't have. Mark Rick is kind of like that older grandfather that you love. You know, no matter what he does right or wrong, he's still your granddad. You love him. But, if you have an offensive coordinator who's like that older brother or that your favorite cousin, you'll do anything for that grandfather, but you're going to go play hard for that older cousin because you don't want to embarrass him. That's why I think we need a younger OC, you know, maybe around the 28 to 25 to 30, 31 range to be able to kind of relate to these kids and get them in a high powered offense to really put up a lot of points. Take you back to when we had James Coley. And Brad Kaya, we were torturing people with a spread offense. And we still ran for over a thousand yards in the shotgun with Duke Johnson. So it has been done in the recent past. And if you're able to bring in a nice spread offense, that could at least give Manny Diaz 35 points. There's not too many teams in college football that could beat us. Not too many teams. Got the Wholesome One on the line. You can join him on YouTube. Just look up the Wholesome One, the You family, and uh, subscribe to his YouTube channel. You get this kind of information and insight and analysis from him. And uh, we talk up uh, our, our buddy Zoe, Alonzo1219. Uh, for more Miami coverage, you go there. And, of course, to State of the U with Cam Underwood. So I kind of bring these guys together, and we talk up Miami football on a regular basis. Uh, wholesome One, I'm going to go through the live chat because there's a number of people that uh, now that we're on to – the offensive play calling and coordinator duties that have um, certainly backed up your thoughts concerning Kendall Bryles uh, and then some other names that are in here include, well, elevating Manny Diaz to the head coaching ranks at Miami. Oh. So that's thrown out there by our guy, uh, Sean Gamble. Hmm. We have a uh, Seth Luttrell who's a, uh, at North Texas, Gerald Williams mentions him. Uh, the Memphis offensive coordinator that left for Texas A&M, I believe you're referring to, is Daryl Dickey. Mm, he was, okay. uh, he was at Memphis uh, when they were scoring a ton of points and was there through 2017. He's moved on to Texas A&M. He was plucked up by uh, Jimbo Fisher. Oh, that name is whew, Jimbo. Good God. Wait. <laughs> Quick, quick thing, Mark. I've always wanted to throw this what if at you. What would you think? How do you think Miami's program would look now if Jimbo Fisher would have been the head coach as opposed to Mark Rick? Oh, so we're talking about Fisher taking over for Al Golden. So at the beginning of 2016, that was uh, Rick's first year. Correct. That's, I mean, this is extreme fantasy because no coach would go from one rival school to another unless it's high school. But could you imagine? I mean, besides Dabo Sweeney and Nick Saban, this has been the biggest th thorn in Miami's side, taking a lot of guys out of Miami Dade County that we loved. And you put him at the helm as an offensive coach? Oh, my God. Yeah, so Jimbo Fisher would have been an extremely good hire. The only thing that went south on him at Florida State, I think much of that had to do with his personal life and personal situation, and uh, that kind of crept into uh, his investment in the program, and there were some bad relationships there uh, that um, kind of signaled his downfall, and then all it took was one bad season to kind of put all that together and make an excuse to – to usher him out of town. So that was kind of a mutual, it's time to move on. But of course, Jimbo Fisher's accomplishments at, at Florida State are pretty obvious, but anytime somebody takes that type of job and turns it into a national championship situation, anybody could win at Florida State to a certain degree. Anybody could stand on the sideline and go eight and four at Florida State, but to elevate it to the national championship, which they hadn't won since, uh, let's see, that was the 1999 team that won the national championship. Yep. They had a nice gap between their 
their national championship. You know, they always say we live in the past, but last time I checked, 99 to 2013 is a nice gap also. Yeah, it took him a while to get back there. Of course, Bobby Bowden then had his leaner years in regards to not being the coach that he was earlier. They were still good for the most part, but uh, they dropped off significantly. We're more of a top 15 to 20 team in, in that range most of those years. And of course, Jimbo took over. And um, aside from the 2017 season, you know, he had an incredible run at Florida State. They they did the the one mark on him would be aside from the way things ended were that during his watch at Florida state, Clemson took over that division. And oh. so he dominated Clemson. Clemson was on the, the rise. You could see it because they were starting to beat teams like Ohio state and Oklahoma in postseason play, but Florida state put them down two or three straight times when Clemson, that was the game of the year in the ACC and Florida state, put him in their place and, and kept him down until 2015. And Deshaun Watson had a lot to do with that. And so, yeah, Jimbo Fisher, I don't necessarily consider him elite elite where, you know, wherever you plug him, he's going to win huge. Now, if he does this at Texas A&M, then I will retract that statement and uh, revise the track record and the resume. He's done it at one place and that's at Florida state. And most guys could win to some degree there. It's hard not to. Uh, but he's not Urban Meyer who's gone to Bowling Green, resurrected a program one big, went to Utah, took a program that was marginal, went 13-0, and goes to Florida. They're losing five games a year, wins two national championships, goes to Ohio State, which they're going to win anyway. But Exactly, yeah. <laughs> games. So he does it everywhere. Nick Saban's done it at his last two stops, LSU and Alabama. And of course, they should win, but LSU was not winning for decades at the degree that Nick Saban was able to elevate that program. If you go back in the history books, the 70s, 80s, and 90s were not kind to LSU football. So I'm not going to, I don't think Jimbo Fisher's there, but I think he's on the next rung. And Dabo has a chance to show us that, that he's Urban Meyer, Nick Saban level. He's certainly on his way and has certainly uh, performed at that level for about five years. But Jimbo Fisher at Miami, based on what we've seen and Texas A&M playing much better football this year, the record doesn't show it. But when you've got Alabama and Clemson on the schedule, it's kind of tough to win games. But yes, I think grading Mark Richt versus Jimbo Fisher, both as a head coach, but more so as an offensive play caller and offensive mind that Jimbo Fisher has stayed up to date. And he still has, he still is a supreme molder of quarterbacks and play caller. What he's doing right now with Kellen Mond as a sophomore is pretty outstanding for the most part. Uh, he's having his bumps in the road again. He's playing in the SEC West and there's not a whole lot of margin for error there and, and not a whole lot of honeymoon period to, to break in. Uh, wow. It's a serious uh, deal over there with LSU, Alabama, Auburn and the likes to deal with. Uh, but I, but I would grade Jimbo Fisher to be a better hire right now, uh, especially if you're needing offense. Oh yeah, that that's what I'm thinking. Oh, and to my Canes fans, I know Jimbo Fisher is a name that we don't really like to hear. <laughs> of course, uh, this is just a fantasy thing that I just brought up because when I have my debates in my inner circle, um, I always say if you're able to take out that one person that just stops you from getting wherever you, you're trying to go. If you're able to bring them alongside you or just get them out of your conference, it makes things a lot easier. And Jimbo, if and, and we'll go back to the Miami talk after this because I know you probably got somebody coming up soon, but Jimbo going back to 2011, 2010, taking guys like Devontae Freeman out of Miami, Offensive alignment out of St. Thomas Aquinas. I mean, a lot of those guys south of West Palm Beach, which is the, the, the tip of the quote-unquote state of Miami, down to the Keys, um, 
a lot of those guys are split between Florida State and Miami. And when Jimbo got there he and, and um, Bobby Bowden took a step down and Jimbo ascended into the, the head coaching job, he took a lot of those guys and a lot of those quote-unquote 50 splits between the two big teams started swaying to Florida State side. So if you're able to pull that guy out of there and bring him to Miami, maybe Nick Saban is the only guy to be able to come in and, and yank some guys out because, you know, Urban isn't taking – you don't really hear about Miami guys go to Ohio State. Urban isn't taking those type of guys out of Miami. So we'll have to really worry about that. Miami guys don't go to Texas or Oklahoma, so we don't have to worry about that issue. They're usually mama's boys, so they're not going way to California. So USC and Oregon are not a part of our issue. It's the Mark Rick at Georgia taking guys like Sony Michelle and Isaiah McKenzie from us. Dabo Sweeney picking guys out of the state of Florida, not necessarily Miami, because he took a lot out of Tampa area. And Jimbo Fisher taking a lot of our top tier guys out of here. I mean, Nick Saban and Alabama speak for themselves. But Amari Cooper would have definitely gotten his offer a lot earlier if Jimbo Fisher was the head coach there, which was an issue there. Devontae Freeman would not have been told that he couldn't play Division I football like Randy Shannon told him because he was five foot eight. Hence why he went off on us every time he played us. Um, you know, countless offense alignment and defense alignment that I might be not thinking of, you know, linebackers like Telvin Smith, who was a, a Miami Florida State split down the middle. Matthew Thomas, big six as he's known in Dade County, would have been able to play in front of his hometown crowd when they had an issue, you know, going up to Florida State, even though he won a national championship as a freshman. I don't think he regrets that much. But just wanted to throw a quick fantasy uh, thought at you. So we've got two comments uh, and suggestions on uh, the live chat. Well, we've got a lot, but uh, Dino Babers at Syracuse doing a nice job. Of course, they're six and two. They're already bowl eligible with a win over NC State last week. They played Clemson really tough, luring Dino Babers from Syracuse to Miami. Ooh, <laughs> that would be beautiful. That's the head coach, right? Yes. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, he would come down to be the Miami head coach. Absolutely. He wouldn't take a coordinator. That's what I was going to say. He's not going to yeah. take an offensive coordinator job. Um, that, that might be a little pushing it, Mark. That's to me. One thing about the state of Florida, you have to have connections here, either homegrown from here, went to college here. I don't know that guy's history. I don't know if he's from here. Is he from Florida? Do you know? I don't know. Yeah, I don't I'll know do if he's a little from Florida. I've never here. heard his name like that. Um, but you got to have connections to the high school area. In almost any area, you have to have deep roots in high school for these coaches to trust you and give their players to you and their you know families to give to you. So offensively wise in the fantasy world, yes. But I don't know if he would be able to be the right coach for Miami as far as knowing this area to recruit, knowing the guys to go get things of that nature. It would be nice offensively, but hopefully I, even he wouldn't start Malik Rozier. Jesus. No, Malik couldn't run his offense. Uh, no, he needs uh, somebody who can uh, get the ball out of their hands and be an extremely accurate on short and intermediate passes to keep that thing going. Um, so he's been all over the place, but nowhere near Florida. And I, I have no indication here. He was born in Honolulu, Hawaii, grew up in San Diego. So there's, there's no connections to anywhere close to Florida. He's been, uh, at Pitt and Texas A&M and UCLA and Baylor. Uh, he's been all over the place every few years as an offensive coach, but, uh, he is a mastermind at running uh, a quick strike offense and, and an offense that gets the ball out of the hands of the quarterback because it's tailor made for a place like Syracuse where they're lining up against North Carolina State, Florida State, Clemson in particular in that division, and they can't rely on an offensive line that's protecting a seven step drop. So he gets that out of the hands of the quarterback and gets the 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 play in space to some guys that he's recruited that uh, do extremely well. And first and foremost this year, that's Jamal Custis having a huge year 
at Syracuse. And again, they're six and two and they're playing really well. But uh, that that was offered up. And also uh, Thomas Towns is asking us and maybe you possibly had heard this, that Mark Richt took the head coaching job under the condition that he would call the plays and also bring in his son as quarterbacks coach. I definitely would not put that past a guy like Mark Rick. Um, honestly, Mark Rick had to choose between us and Virginia. Those were the two jobs that were open at the time that were willing to bring in Mark Rick. Um, so part of me truly believes that because I think Mark Rick felt this though. You guys have been down for a while. I'm a top 20, top 25 coach coming to your program to rebuild this program and it's my alma mater. So he could probably throw a lot of things in there that he would want done to guarantee that he takes this job. So I could almost, I'll say I'm 85% sure that had a lot to do with it. Yeah. Because I know times. He had voices opinion about wanting to get back into calling plays, uh, in 2016. You also hear the name Lane Kiffin tossed around because uh, he had the big jobs with the Raiders, Tennessee, and USC as a, I, I don't know that there's been a man in the history of college football, in the history of both levels of football uh, going back for decades and decades that at his age was able to <laughs> gain those type of positions. Uh, USC, Tennessee, the Oakland Raiders. Uh, of course, he had his issues at all three stops and had to prove himself first as, as an offensive coordinator and come back up through the ranks, uh, led some very ex successful offenses, calling the plays at Alabama. Now he's the head coach at Florida Atlantic, and they suddenly have taken off, and uh, he's able to draw in uh, higher-level recruits than they're used to. But um, Lane Kiffin running the Miami program, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. Somebody else is also suggesting that he comes in as offensive coordinator. I don't know that he would still uh, take that type of job as an offensive coordinator now that he's put himself back in circulation as a head coach. Well, I know for a fact that uh, he wouldn't come in and take a back seat to Mark Richt. I know that for sure. So he wouldn't be an offensive coordinator for Mark Richt. But it's funny you say Lane Kiffin. I have a cousin, Andrew Soro. He wears number 14 at FAU. He's there starting um, Rover. And uh, he had the big hit in their bowl game last year. I don't know if you, that would jog your memory into who I'm talking about. Hmm. Um, he kind of made the ESPN talk. He lit a guy up. Oh, it was bad. I'll have, um, to, check out. <laughs> huh? I'll have to check that out. Oh, yeah. It, it was a decleating. <laughs> I went bananas in the stands. Um, but in actuality, hearing him talk about what Lane Kiffin brings to the table, that would probably be, if I could be the AD and I did want to get rid of Mark Rick, that would be the very first call I make to a guy, to Lane Kiffin. Because when, I, when Miami is successful, we don't do things the traditional, the traditional way. We don't bring in an old good boy down from way yonder to do things the right way, sign the right guys, and and play buttoned-up football. That's not how we play football in Miami. When we were at our peak, we had a fiery, aggressive head coach that would probably stand at the 50 and sure shake your hand but deck you right in the mouth if he had to. That's the type of coaches we had with Jimmy Johnson – and maybe not Dennis Erickson. He he was a little quieter. Um, but Butch Davis was that type of coach to where they were just aggressively, aggressive, fiery guys. And if you're able to tell me I could match up Manny Diaz and Lane Kiffin, I, I don't really think there's too many people that could beat us um, on a grand stage of things. Um, so, uh Mile Maker 33, he's a uh, Mile Marker 33. He's got uh, the idea that uh, may uh, be the perfect uh, the perfect team to put together here if you keep Mark Richt in as the CEO and he runs a respectable program and makes sure everything stays on, stays on the rails. And then you've got Manny Diaz as defensive coordinator and Lane Kiffin as the offensive coordinator. Maybe that's a dream team. 
Most definitely. I mean, honestly, could you think about that? Those three guys coming into a recruit's house, how could they say, I mean, what do you say <laughs> to that? I mean, you have Mark Rick making sure nothing happens wrong. You got Lane Kiffin, who's averaging, what, 45 points with FAU talent? Even he, I think even Lane Kiffin, think about what he was able to do with Lane, with, with Jalen Hurts. To me, Malik Rozier is a poor man's Jalen Hurts. He's just that. He's probably a, a notch or two under Jalen Hurts as far as freshman Jalen Hurts. Um, and that's bad. Redshirt senior Malik Rozier is, is under a freshman Jalen Hurts. That's bad. But if you think about what he was able to do with the guy who couldn't really complete much more than a 10, 15-yard pass, even he could probably get 11 wins out of Malik Rozier this year with that offense and how he would scheme and how he would attack defenses using uh, Malik Rozier. But Lane Kiffin, I don't know who – I don't really know much about Lane Kiffin's, you know, dad or whatever. I don't know who he knows, but that guy's coaching career is just like none other. I mean, the youngest NFL head coach – I think at that point, I think they've had younger coaches now, but he was the youngest NFL head coach at that point. Had two marquee Division I jobs, SC and Tennessee. If you were able to add a Miami to that, oh, man. Especially coming off of him being chewed out by Nick Saban every five seconds for not running the ball every play and him wanting to prove to the world that he could be a head coach again at a top, 30 program at the University of Miami. Oh, that, that's a match made in heaven right there. There you have it from the wholesome one. We appreciate everyone joining the live chat. Uh, this is our first ever live stream at Mark Rogers TV Miami. If you love college football and want to hear it coast to coast, uh, all the Power Five conferences in particular, then you head on over to Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. And of course, Miami fans, if you're on this live stream, you love the cane. So check out the wholesome one. The wholesome one, the you family right here on YouTube. And uh, we'll have more Miami talk coming up. Uh, either I have yet to decide. I guess I should decide either, whether that's going to be at uh, my main channel or over here at Mark Rogers TV Miami. But we've got Zoe coming on at 7 o'clock Eastern time to talk more Miami football. And then I'm going to take in this uh, Virginia Pitt game uh, for the ACC Coastal lead. I know that Miami fans are cringing when they hear that. Uh, that those kind of rosters are, are fighting for first place the, the first weekend of November uh, in the ACC Coastal Division. All right, Wholesome One, we appreciate you stopping by and giving us some insight into this Miami situation as the Canes uh, prep for a Duke coming into Coral Gables uh, Hard Rock Stadium on a Saturday night. Yeah, thank you. No problem, Mark. I truly appreciate it, man. I, like I said, I always do appreciate you um, giving me the opportunity to get on here. Hopefully next week when we get a chance to get back on, I'll get the camera working. Before we weren't even able to link up. Now we just got the voice. So next week we'll have the, the video ready to go. I don't know what's up with that, but I'll get it fixed. Um, Your voice is crystal clear, and that's what's important. And uh, it was good to hear from you, wholesome one. So you have a great night. Don't work too hard at work. Uh, keep those people in line. Oh, I definitely will. And uh, hopefully Pitt wins tonight because that's the only way Virginia – we'll get a three-way tie somehow. If Virginia wins out, there's no way we can get in. So That's right. Virginia holds that trump card with the uh, win over Miami. Most definitely. Right All now. right, Mark. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Dwayne. Go Canes. We also have our newsletter available for anyone. Uh, if you would like to subscribe to our newsletter, and it's giving uh, getting uh, rave reviews from everyone uh, as a, a must-read on Monday afternoon, it's uh, – the voice of college football. So you send your email address, send your email address to mine. So we exchange emails, Mark Rogers TV at Gmail. So you send your email address to Mark Rogers TV at Gmail. I'll send you the voice of college football each and every Monday with a channel update, uh, stats, trends, and facts that you won't find anywhere else. And my take on the college football weekend. We appreciate you guys stopping by. Always enjoy the live chat. And this being the first one on the live stream here at uh, Mark Rogers TV Miami. Thanks for making it a very successful one. We will see you very soon. We've got uh, Alonzo1219 coming up at 7 o'clock Eastern time. I think we'll swing that back over to Mark Rogers TV. 
the voice of college football. So again, seven o'clock Eastern time with Zoe, one, two, one, nine, and uh, post-game analysis tonight on Virginia and Pitt inexplicably for the ACC Coastal League. We'll see you soon.